Well, it, it's a, a pleasure to be here, and, and just to set expectations right, the talk I, I, I did, you know, I was like uh, running around doing thermodynamics and then going to the art school and doing, you know, thing, and then dissecting a brain, and so, you know, it was a very strange academic background, but that data was old, and what I've done recently is there's been an explosion of new information on how people make decisions, and I've spent some fairly serious time revisiting the literature and see if there's anything there that might be of use to us. And that's what this, this topic, blind spotting, is about. Be, before I begin, how many of you folks are just kind of uh, dazed or amazed? Uh, like Somali pirates, did you ever think that was going to happen? There we go. All right. So um, anybody here like uh, lost a third or a half of their 401k? <laughs> that, you saw that coming, right? Um, and, uh, we, of course, we've, uh, you know, we've focused our resources and we found Osama bin Laden. I mean, there's, this, is, this has been, the, the, the effort here is, is that in the last two years, we've seen this incredible confirmation that we don't necessarily do a very good job of predicting the future. And that's a little bit of the topic here. Now, this idea of predicting the future has long been important to us. Every single leader, you know, from before the Delphi Oracle said, you know, read me the tea leaves, you know, do what it is, give me some edge for the future. And over centuries, we've got to the stage where we're getting a little bit better. How many folks checked weather.com before you came here? Yeah, a fair amount. And, and, and I've actually looked at the statistics on weather, and for two to three days out, we don't do too bad. Ten days, you know, it's like reading tarot cards. But... <laughs> But, but we, 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 we are at the stage where we can use science and engineering and things like that to uh, predict the future. Now, the, the one thing that I want to tell you uh, about blind spots is I'm not talking about just where the, you know, the, the optic nerve goes to the back of the eye and you've got this spot that if you fix. For me, a blind spot is any perceptual, cognitive, or cultural bias that tends to have us believe in stuff that isn't true and make predictions for the future that don't, don't come out quite right. So it's a very broad definition here. I, I was into this about four, four months, and I sort of suddenly realized that the stupidest thing I could do is to investigate blind spots with any, anybody to tell me that I was stupid. And so, so I re recruited somebody who had no, no hesitancy to tell me I was stupid, David Ullman, to kind of go back and forth, does this make sense and the rest of that. So what I, what I want to do now is just give a thanks to David for the time he spent. And he had, there was something in it for him, too, because he's always had this idea of robust decisions, and we can use Bayesian methods to make better decisions. And I'm going, people aren't going to do that. So we, so we had this wonderful dialogue. And so, David, where are you? So thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> So, so David was kind of a voice of, you know, not cognitive science, but like that doesn't work for me and stuff like that, and it worked. Now, the one thing I want you to know is uh, one cognitive psychologist said 1% of our cognitive active activity is conscious. We know what's going on. You know, we, we can kind of direct it. And 99% is pre-conscious or subconscious. Now, this is not... This is, this is a metaphor rather than a number. Of our 10 billion neurons, what he's not saying, we only know what's going on at 100 million at a, at a time. But the point is, is that there's an incredible amount that is not consciously accessible to us. Let me give you some examples of that because you probably won't believe it. How many of you folks find that you uh, go to sleep at night and if you're thinking about a problem, somehow in the morning as you're just waking up, a better idea comes? Yeah. We do a lot of processing there. In fact, what I tell, I mean, it's so, so repeatable for me that I tell clients, if you want me for a day, get me for an afternoon in the next morning, and I'll load up my mind and try to think nothing of you and turn off the cell phones, and, and like, like nine times out of ten, I wake up with an idea in the morning. That's one example. Another example is prejudice. They've done incredible recent research that shows that people, you know, we all go, I'm not prejudiced. But if you look at reaction times, is the white guy got a gun or the black guy got a gun in a picture that were slower, the black guy's got the gun. So subconsciously, even though you know, we have no prejudice that we know that you know, all our friends are blacks or you know, whatever, there's this subconscious thing going on in, in most of us. Probably, where's John Hurstick? Is he here? Yeah, so John is a conscious card counter. 
You know, he talked about this. He, he, you know, he, there's this, this incredible ability in the movie and the MIT. So a really bright guy who learned how to count cards as well as start, you know, really customer-oriented companies. But another thing that's possible is, yeah, you know, it's, it's like, where do those fit? Um, but but uh, if you have a stacked deck and an unstacked deck and you take somebody who's not a conscious card counter, long before they consciously know what's going on, they go, I don't want to pick a card from that stack. There's something wrong with that deck. Um, blindsight. Anybody heard of the term blindsight? In some cases, it's possible that the, that the, the connections to, to, to the, the conscious part of our cortex of vision are cut, and people cannot see what's going on, but there's a few other connections going to other areas so they can guess where things are, and they guess with incredible probability. Uh, split blind cover stories, you know, we've done this thing where you, you split the corpus callosum, and, and you show one thing to one part of the brain and the other part to the other brain, and, and so, so, you know, you might go to, like, John, like, so you show the smart car here, and then you, you, and you show, like, a horse over here, and, and, uh, and he doesn't see the smart car, and you go, John, you know, uh, what are you doing? And he'll give an explanation based on a horse, like, you know, I really wanted to have a horse, but instead I decided that because a smart car is the same, you know, length, that that's what I'm going to buy or something, that we literally even though we don't know the information, we do this. So, so and uh, uh, perhaps the best analogy for this is Tor Narotronders has written a book called The User Illusion, and his metaphor for this is that consciousness is like the user interface to our brain. Think about, th so you think about like the gazillion lines of code in like Windows 7 and all that kind of stuff. Consciousness is Bob. You know, consciousness... <laughs> <laughs> Consciousness, consci and we can direct, like, like if I'm looking for something, if I want to find somebody in a crowd, you know, like if I want to find Ping, I set, of, set, set filters like, where is this really attractive Chinese lady who is, is going to be a little bit shorter than some of the other people? And I go, there's Ping. <laughs> and, and so, and so you, we, can, we can set filters, but we really don't have, a, have control of it. So just all I'm trying to say is more or less 1 to 99% makes sense. Now, we are mighty proud of that 1%. If you think about everything that we do in this room, building, planning, inventing, managing, designing, scheduling, it's all how do we improve that 1% of conscious planning activity, stuff we do now because that building is going to be better in the future, that product is going to be... I mean, what we do is with that 1% try to figure out stuff that's better for the future. And in fact, Almost all scientists have this deal of what's the difference between man and the animals. It's opposable thumbs, we use tools, and one by one we're getting those, those things sort of stripped away from us. And the last thing that folks said is it's consciousness and the ability to plan for the future. And it turned out that Santino had some really bad news for us. Santino is a chimpanzee in a Swedish zoo, the alpha male leader of the pack. Anybody know about Santino? Yeah, so, so Santino consciously, the, the primatologist studied him, would days before go searching for a cache of weapons of not entirely mass destruction. Santino would collect rocks from the bottom and go hide them. Because he was really ticked off that his whole tribe, you know, there was a bunch of people watching and stuff like that, and he just wanted to be left alone. So Tan Santino would get all these rocks, and then he'd get really pissed in the middle of the day when people are watching. He'd go and he'd start throwing the rocks. Now, the good thing is that Santino wasn't, you know, he, he was not like major league material. So, <laughs> so, so he didn't do, do, and do a lot of damage. But the clear conclusion here is that chimps have a conscious life, and they do planning. So you might say, well, the difference in humans is we do such a better job of planning. <laughs> So, <laughs> now, <laughs> I, 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 I want to make it clear, I am not, I am not saying that, that Bush is a primate. <laughs> I am not saying that the 51% of us that elected him as our alpha leader are primates. I'm saying that we're all primates that we all have these biases <laughs> hidden in that 99% that keep us from making accurate decisions for the future. And that if we're honest about our track record, we've got some work to do.
That's the point I'm trying to make. And notice, so how many folks here were kind of like, kind of, kind of were glad that I put that slide up there? Man, he, you know, ah, uh, yeah. And how many people were like really pissed because like, like, you know, he's a good guy. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's a good guy. And I mean, he looks like an alpha leader and we don't give him enough credit. And how many people thought, you know, stop beating like a dead primate? <laughs> yeah, so, 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 so my point here is, is, not about the pros or cons or, of, of Bush. My point is whether you liked or disliked that, that came from an emotional, hidden 99% of the place. How many folks had like political discussions over those last things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, and it's like you know, there, there's the, like, like pretending that it's, it's dealing with the 1% isn't reflecting reality. So, so this is not a political comment. This is a humankind comment that I'm trying to make at this point. Here's another one. Um, here is a graph showing what percent of profits, what percent of value add in the U.S. industry came from the financial sector. Now think about what the financial sector is. The financial sector does not directly add any value at all. All it does is find someone who promises to add value or use value and make it happen a little bit sooner. Anybody bought a house here recently? I mean, you know, the prices are good. But, you know, finance, finance lets you buy a house earlier than you could. Anybody, like, like Ping started a company, actually several companies. You know, and finance lets you start a company sooner than you can start it for yourself. So there's value to that. But the value is like, you know, 10, 20 percent of the value. I mean, there's some level that's historically right. Why didn't we notice when it got to 40 percent that maybe it wasn't adding value, that it was picking our pockets? Why didn't, why didn't, why didn't we, why didn't we say, hey, that's really great. Let's, let's make that 100 <laughs> percent. We are all falling, you know, why, why are we blind to these things is really the question. So, as I said, there's been this huge amount of research. It's based on uh, genetics. It's based on, like, Kahneman and Tversky's, you know, a long work on biases. Uh, we're actually, we have the ability now to do brain scans that see activities of the, of the brain. We, we can actually shut off parts of the brain. So, so there's been this explosion of research. I've gone through literally thousands of sources, hundreds of books. I'm now at the level of having uh, a, a word for this. I call it blind spotting and more to the point, have documented more than 120 blind spots. These are things where psychologists have done well-controlled experiments, and there's a bias, either perceptually or cognitive, in a few cases, not many in this list, culturally, that keep us from seeing things as they are. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole list here. Steve Wolf kind of, you know, uh, said, you, you're doing the usual thing, Pete. You've got way too much information here. But, but there's a lot of these things. Anybody got one they want to pick? All right, so, 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 so everybody, anybody heard the Texas sharpshooter fallacy? So this is the fallacy that says um, it's easy to see a pattern of things after they happen and give a cause for it, and we, and we like to do that and think we're actually get some information. For example, at the end of the day, every business report says the Dow went up or went down because customers were blah, 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 blah. Never have you heard any news story say, uh, blah, blah, blah has happened and the Dow is going to go up 20%. You with me on that? That's the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. So we, we've got literally hundreds of these biases buried in the 99% that affect our thinking. Now, I also, we've got a baby here, but I want to warn you about the dangers of baby pictures. <laughs> There's wonderful research that shows that, that people pay attention to babies. In fact, there's theories that language is created and this mother's kind of you know, signaling back and forth of babies. But what I want to tell you is that every time you've heard about somebody who says how to win friends and influence people, how to do influence, how to get your ideas across, it's an exploitation of one of our biases. For example, how many people I recommended at one point the book Made to Stick? Anybody read that? Yeah. So, so the Heaths say um, things should be simple. Make things simple. 
Well, the world is complicated. We have a bias. It's called the ambiguity bias. We hate things that are complicated. If we can't make it simple, we don't believe it. So that's a bias. And then he said, it, it's, it's got to be surprising. Well, we have a bias to this surprise and change. So that, like, if somebody slowly steals your money, don't notice that. Only notice it when your wallet's completely gone. That's another bias. Keep things concrete. That's called the availability bias, the availability heuristic, which is if you can't think of a, of a concrete example, it must not be true. And, if, and in fact, people if, if are more likely, something that's incredibly, uh, very probable and abstract, they think is less likely than something that's not very probable but concrete. Get things credible. You know, uh, I'm not a doctor, I just play one on TV. That's a bias. Uh, reach emotion, the 90% stories. The reason we have Snopes is because stories are so effective. So, so if Cialdini was the master of, you know, he wrote the book on interest, and then he wrote a more popular one, yes, 50, well, basically what he did is he took 50 biases and said, here's how to, here's how to get people to agree with you. And they, they exploit that. So those, that's just, so beware of babies. They're, 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 uh, they could be dangerous. <laughs> so why don't we just stop fooling ourselves? You know, and, and, and I could offer to uh, go through the list of 120 biases, and I've tried in my own life to, to correct a few of them, because I've got them, and, and find the antidote for each of that. Well, it's a little bit complicated. They're hard to get to. There's a whole bunch of reasons why I'm not going to talk about the 120 today. Um, and it wouldn't be very effective if, if we wanted to do it anyhow. Let me just give you some high-level issues. Every one of those biases is kind of a shortcut. Anybody read Malcolm Gladwell's the book Blink? That was an homage to the power of our subconscious thinking. I'm a firefighter, and I know what I'm doing. You've had the, like, like anybody remember guys, like engineers learning to dance. I'll put, I think about putting my foot, you know, in a, and, and it's only when an action becomes subconscious in sports. Like, like, like I've had these moments of, like, you know, as, as a soccer player when, like, I had no idea what I was doing, but it sure was good because I practiced enough. So, so all of these have a purpose, so you can't jettison them. A lot of the thinking that happens there is very powerful and good thinking. Because they're inaccessible, they're hard to get rid of in ourselves, and because they're embedded in somebody else, they're impossible to get rid of in some, almost somebody else. You know, so, like, uh, uh, you know, we, it's like the, the Bush versus Obama versus Clinton discussions. You know, it's like, like I'm going to change your mind, right? Not going to happen. So that's one issue. Another is Darwin Awards. Um, we have bias towards optimism, overconfidence, and risk-taking. There are exceptions to that. There are some people that are depressed. But by and large, we, we, we have a bias that says, if Santino is the head of the Klan and I'm a young guy, hey, let's fight it out. You know, let's, I'll, I'll risk stuff. I'll do something because look at the, I mean, those chimps, those, those three lady chimps over there, man, that's, that's worth doing. And, and so, so originally in hunter-gatherer societies, you know, if you lost a couple stupid guys along the way, it wasn't a big deal. It was, it was a way of, you know, getting, getting better genes at the pool. So we've got this very adaptive bias that works in small groups. Now the problem is, is you've got like, like guys, you know, like, like guys with their buttons on nuclear weapons in Korea and soon to be Iran, who, who in their quest to win a Darwin Award can take down millions of people. We've got single people of companies who, in their quest to, you know, make another couple million, can, can take down, you know, the pensions of 50,000 people. That the scale at which we are now using these biased actions don't affect just the actor. They affect thousands, millions, possibly a whole planet at a time. So, so we've, we've kind of... We're using the same old metal mechanisms in a very, very different world, and there's some consequences for that. Another issue is, is that uh, we're incredibly biased to uh, immediate gratification. In, in the hunter-gatherer days, you know, when we're doing the gene pool and stuff like that, survival was in seconds or milliseconds. Saber-toothed tiger. Or, and, 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 and value-add, I mean, that was, that was it. Today... Today, it's like, I think for the next 10 years, I'm going to have a Big Mac every day for breakfast. That's the bigger threat than saber-toothed tigers. Uh, then, value add was like, did we have a good hunt today? 
Today, value add is I've got a five-year plan for a really new cool company or I've got a three-year product development thing for the car that's going to save Chrysler. And, and it's a law. So, so the, the scales have entirely changed, yet we're biased towards immediate gratification. And probably the most noticeable thing of that is there are actually biased and evolutionary and genetic and heuristics that say quarterly profits pursued is a good thing. And so we, so we embrace that. Another example here is, is good news, bad news. You really want to know what's going on inside that, that other person's you know, mind or whatever. So, so you know, I could have, like, like as, uh, you know, so if somebody disagrees and I, and I can see, I go, you know, you don't quite, with, you're not with me or you're angry. Anybody here have either yourself or your spouse you cried at a movie ever happened? Yeah, yeah. So what mirror neurons are, and we've actually discovered that we have these neuronal clusters that pick up the incredibly minor and small kind of facial configurations, postural things, and we replicate the emotional state of the person or sometimes the animal that we're looking at so that we empathize and understand what's going on. And if they do a, you know, a good job of it, we cry at movies, we get angry in a bar, you know, all those kind of things happen. That's about the only way we have of accessing the 99% that's going on inside the minds of our colleagues. That's the good news. That's a, that it's not always right. We can get fooled. We can get spoofed. But that's the mechanism we've got. Now we're in this new web 2.0, 3.0 world, and the equivalent of mirror neurons is a smiley face. I'm just kidding. It's, it, you know, so so, so in, until we really have much better tools of accessing that information, we're missing a lot of what's going on. You with me on that? Good news, bad news. Uh, and then we have these attention biases that uh, the, all of the, the old mechanisms were something moving fast in the peripheral, got to run. Uh, sharp pain, better pay attention to that. And it was, it, was, it was a very short time, part of this immediate gratification, immediate attention shifting, where, whereas today uh, the attention shifts, you know, sometimes the dangers are slow, sometimes the problems are slow. We don't, we're not even paying attention, witness what's happened to our 401ks and all the other things to what really matters. So, so those are the issues that we need to, need to confront. And the problem for decision making in enterprises is that what we're dealing with is this 1% tip of the iceberg in our colleagues. We're dealing with not, we don't necessarily know the deep expertise they have. We don't know the deep biases that we've got. When we sit in a team meeting, all we really see is the tips of the iceberg, whereas all these, these incredible hidden assets as well as hidden agendas are very difficult for us to get at and even more difficult kind of in an electronic world. So, so, so that's the issue, and, and, and it's a real issue. Let me give you some examples. Is, that, is Bill Corelli here? Don't know yet. Pardon? No, okay. So, so years ago, with with uh, Bill and some others, I had an opportunity to look at how people made IT investment decisions, and out of that came the book Aligning Technology for Best Business Results. And one of the fascinating things for me is there was about 20 companies in the study, and of the decisions we looked at, 19 of 20 of, one of them, they had a conscious, detailed, precise process for evaluating the competing systems. And the dominant way of doing that was creating a spreadsheet, though there were a lot of different tools used. Creating a spreadsheet with all of the important factors, rating each of the vendors on that factor, and then having an importance factor, and then calculating which vendor was the best. The interesting thing was more than half the companies performed that exercise, took months doing it, and then threw away the results to make a gut feel decision. Uh, another example, so I, I, I did work around the world for IBM and customer buying behavior and the rest of that. And at one point they asked me about branding. And they had this incredibly detailed three level deep of brands. You know, so like it's IBM, ThinkPad, you know, TrackPoint, you know, and, and they, so they literally had this huge map of brands, and they said, well, what do you think about this? We've really got the customers nailed now. And, and what I did for them is I, I took an organization chart of IBM and an organization chart of the brands and pointed out that every really important executive had a brand, <laughs> and, they, and each of them fought to have a brand and it had nothing to do 
how with, with what customers thought about it. That's an example of this going on. Um, is Brenda or Buzz here? Buzz yeah, Buzz is. So, so, so Buzz gave me an opportunity a few years back as part of a launch to visit a whole bunch of small and medium-sized businesses and really kind of dig in and see how the processing. I mean, for me, it was, it was just fabulous, and it was great for the small companies too. And, and two things struck me of all those companies that we visited. You know, we go through and, and it like, like two hours trying to find exactly how the business is going, where can the technology be applied. One is that these were great, wonderful, small companies, each of which was incredibly blind to a powerful opportunity to remove a constraint from its business. That's something that, I mean, it's, it's the biggest risk in a small company that you're really good at a bunch of stuff, but there's just something, you know, like the, if the CEO's a sales guy, you miss the engineering stuff, you miss something. And the other thing is that the VARs were also blind to something. You know, it, I can't tell you how many times you walk in and you just ask the right questions, and it turns out they could never, you know, the guy that they were trying to sell to was like the, the, pre, the, fo the founder and, and uh, owner of the company's son, and they didn't know that. And I, that makes things different. That makes things a lot of different. And in the auto industry, I mean, I, I, clients, you know, they go, you know, you're going to go out of business. Here's why. Yeah, we agree with that. But let's just keep doing what we're doing. So, so these are real things that affect how we work in, uh, in, in business today. So what do we do with this information? What are the, uh, the things? I've got seven ideas to consider. And, uh, and it's more of a dialogue than anything else. One is we can recognize our shared biases. For example, one of them for engineers is we, we really like to be right. My, my wife goes crazy. You know, she goes like, like I say something, you go, well, it's actually like three points here and two points there. You know, we want to just nail it. Any, anybody kind of fess up to that? <clears throat> yeah. Well, see, see, the problem is that leads us to end up only attacking problems where we can be right and avoiding the ones that are important. An example from Homeland Security is... Uh, this country did a really good job of almost 100% eliminating the danger of little old ladies taking manicure scissors onto the planes. <laughs> we pretty much nailed that one. <laughs> While at the same time, we did nothing to keep almost uh, somebody from taking a dirty nuclear bomb in, uh, in any of the gazillion ships that visit any port and setting it off. We would rather, it's a real one of the 120 biases, we would rather reduce, reduce a known risk to zero than a far, far greater risk to 50%. And that's a bias in how engineering you know, uh, attacks its activities. <coughs> Evening news. We've got the national, local, the weather. The weather guys are interesting because we love hearing the weather. I mean, think about what this news The national news is like, oh, my God. The local news is, watch out. The weather is, um, we're going to tell you, I mean, it's actually useful information. We're going to tell you whether to get a, you know, uh, uh, an umbrella out tomorrow, though they're not often right. And then sports is like, well, now at least I'm part of the tribe. And, and what, what's missing there is the engineering news. The engineering uses this really information, useful information that says the National Engineering Academy today told Congress that corn for ethanol does not have a good energy balance. Don't do it. <laughs> the engineering news is we've looked at CFLs, and despite the concerns of mercury, at the end of life cycle, if the Chinese will only give us reliable ones, they're actually a good deal. The engineering news is uh, now is a decent time to put a solar panel on your roof because the payback is finally there. Uh, but you better drive your Prius for 10 years before you do it. The, the really useful information could come from engineering if we were only willing to step up. I mean, it's actually an opportunity for marketing. If, you know, every large company here could do the engineering news, and, and we're only just beginning with some of the sustainability things to do, closed-loop kind of predictions of what's going on. So that's another idea. Um, if you think about what engineering does, well, all the planning and designing and stuff, we are making economic predictions for the future. We're saying if you invest in this product, it'll have a return. If you make this metal too thin, it will buckle. Now, if you look at the distribution of where we contribute in those decisions, we tend to be down low on the list. For example, I have the tool gene. I like, like try to own every tool known to man and use it once. 
you see the tool chest, you see the tool chest there. I actually have 60 units, like the top or a bottom of that, of which 15 were made by craftsmen at one point in the future. Now, the geniuses at Sears decided in the last set of three that I stacked up to hold my micrometers that, that, <coughs> that, <coughs> that they were going to make them in China with thinner metal with fewer spot welds. They made this engineering decision by probably some accountant that said, who cares if we, we make it cheaper? Well, when two of the three arrived, they, they had terrible logistics. They didn't know when they were going to get it there. That was another problem. Two of the three arrived cockeyed. And then they, they couldn't get them back. I mean, it was, it was like a horror story, which I've done. I've told everybody in the world that I know not to buy Steers tool chests. So, so their decision process has resulted in I will never buy another Sears tool chest, number 61. In fact, I am now, I used to have the 15 and it's minus because I got rid of one because I didn't need it anymore. I got another one that was better and, you know. So, so the, the point is that's, that's a trivial example of spot welds and materials, but they screwed up at least for me. And then we've got the big decisions like Hummers are the future of our company and we're, that's really going to be a good thing. We need to step up. We need to start thinking of ourselves as uh, stop listening to Bernie Madoff for the future and start listening to engineers and we're going to step up even if we're not 100% right about things. If we're, even though we're not 100% right about O-rings, we're going to be more adamant that maybe we shouldn't launch this time. We should do a little more research. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, so you run the numbers. That's all I'm saying. And you run the numbers right now, and GM has not been a genius. They're, they're right there with other primate leaders of the world. So <laughs> <coughs> the next one is to become a voice of confidence. You know, I've done some research with folks called up and stuff, and basically people are saying, you know, we got some money to invest. You guys got some money to invest. A lot of people got some money to invest, but we're not willing to do that until we know what the return is. Now, we, I, I see in my own work, you know, customer buying decisions that before my, my sole criterion was market share. Demand was assumed. People wanted to buy cars. They wanted to buy this and that. Demand is not assumed going forward. Even Toyota, you know, Toyota could have 100% market share and still have questions about demand. But there are a whole bunch of areas that should be no-brainers. Things like like, uh, if, if I, I we're just about at the point that I can come to you and say, I'm going to put solar panels on your roof. I guarantee your electric bill is not going to go up. We're going to take the money out of it. Your electric bill will be 10 y years less. I'll put an insurance policy so nothing happens on it. And at the end of 15 years, it's yours. That's a no-brainer. That's a no-brainer. You pay less, and you get something in the end for free, and, and you get to pat yourself on the back as a cool guy. And, and, and there are opportunities like that in infrastructure and other areas, and we're not stopping up to do the numbers for people. So, so we can instill confidence in this economy if we do it right. Another is belief and attention, Matt. And I, I'm going to... Uh, 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 Brad? So we, we lost 50... Okay. So, so <clears throat> in sorting through these 120, I took several tries at what's the best way of getting a handle around these 120. And I looked at time sequences and a whole bunch of stuff, and Dave said, nobody will ever go for that. And so so the, the best way I can think of, of mapping this stuff is we have beliefs and we have attention, and we can kind of sort what's going on. Now, uh, let me define a belief. We have 10 billion neurons. We have 10 trillion, not that necessarily that many connections, and a whole process where we get clusters of neurons that kind of do if-then stuff. A, when you learn to throw a, a ball that doesn't look like a girl, that's, though girls are throwing balls pretty well these days, that, 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 that's a neuronal pattern. When you learn to do finite element analysis, when you believe in the flying spaghetti monster, when you, when you think, what, all those things are, are neuronal patterns, and I'm calling those things belief. They can be knowledge, they can be myths, but I'm, uh, that's what I call a belief. And so, we, so there's a whole bunch of things that go there. And, and my sole metric for a belief, it's true if it has predictive utility. So if, does anybody have a coin here? Yeah, so if, if I flip it, if, if my belief is that coins always come up heads, that's my belief, and, and, I, and I do this enough, and my predictive utility is like half the time I'm wrong unless it's a fixed coin. So not much predictive utility there. Uh, 
uh, but it, like, like the sun is going to come up tomorrow. Pretty good predictive utility, even though it's called the classic problem of induction, someday it's not going to be true. Hopefully we've learned, you know, to, to find other suns by then. So that's what a belief is. And we have bunches of problems in believing stuff whoops, that isn't so. So in the past we thought, well, the earth is flat, you know, Galileo shouldn't look through telescopes, or we're going to, you know, like hang them up, you know, on the gallows. Physicians don't need to wash their hands. There's nothing like germs and stuff like that. Iraq has WMD. The war will be over in a few days. And fill in the blank and be trusted with your money. We, we, we often have beliefs that we do not require sufficient evidence for. We don't flip the coin. We don't test it. There's also this problem of long tails. A lot of the problems we get into is we assume things that have a Gaussian distribution that, in fact, do not have a normal distribution. There's real big risks hiding out in the long tails. And we've also had beliefs in our own industry like outsourcing drives profits. It's been like great for the ERP guys. It's been great for the PLM guys. Too bad we're gradually getting rid of all of our customers. And so, so <clears throat> there, are, there are issues like that. And then there's the tension. We get an incredible amount of information thrown at us every day. We have to filter that out. The question is, and, and, and the way Dave and I sort of looked at this thing, is probably the best way is the old engineering signal to noise. What you want to do is get all signal and, and, and get rid of all the noise. You want a perfect spam filter. That's what, and it, but it's a difficult thing to do that we've got biases buried in there. And in fact, many of the worst things that have happened in the engineering world and in the world at large have been failures of attention. A failure of attention is when somebody knew what was going on, had a perfectly good model to describe it, and we said, nah, 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 pillow to the hand. You know, so, so example, Pearl Harbor. Example, Space Shuttle Challenger 9. All of these are examples where Pearl Harbor, we intercepted the Japanese saying we're going to come and you know, knock Pearl Harbor out. We go, well, I don't want to hear that. Uh, Space Shuttle Challenger. An engineer said, we've done the numbers. You know, the O-rings might be a problem. Man, that'll really ruin my day. You know, we're not going to, well, we won't be on time. We might lose funding. 9-11. Uh, an FBI agent says, you know, isn't it curious that these guys that look like terrorists want to fly planes but refuse to learn how to land them? Shouldn't we pay attention to that? And, and he tries to escalate, and his boss says, you know, man, the last time I did anything with Muslims, they, I got, like, political bias, and this is not a career-enhancing mood, so let's not pay attention to that. Enron, these guys are the masters of the energy unis, universe. They'll pay attention to that. GM and Chrysler, you know, we don't have to listen to this energy stuff. We're doing just fine quarter by quarter. Subprime masses, you know, don't, you know, don't worry about that. we got this under control. These guys are geniuses. Bernie Madoff, well, he must be good. He's got, you know, deference to authority. And even everyday change orders are all areas where it wasn't lack of knowledge that killed us. It was failures of attention. So you can uh, kind of map these things in a way that may be useful. So, so if, you, if you map your beliefs, in the middle is there's no data, it's random or unprovable. That would be a coin flip, we haven't done the research, or like the flying spaghetti monster, like uh, I thor thoroughly believe in the flying spaghetti monster, you almost drink the Kool-Aid to believe in the fly flying spaghetti monster, but there is in fact absolutely no way you'll ever know if there's a flying spaghetti monster. Nothing wrong with believing that, just don't try to predict the future uh, based on it. So, so true is probably, there's, there's probably almost nothing that is true for all time that we can prove, but there are stu things like the sun rising next morning, you know, the metal's too thin that have higher degrees of probability, and there are things like, uh, uh, that are less and less likely as we go through there. So we can map, we can map truth. And we can map attention. So right in the middle here, it's kind of an interesting thing, is like, I'm open to everything. Somehow my brain has been wired that there's no sensory filtering. I don't have a keeper at the gate, like, like, like Buzz, like, you know, won't answer his phone, but he'll answer his email and stuff like that. You've got filters. And it's because everybody wants a piece of Buzz. And, and, and so, you know, <laughs> I just call him. So, 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 so we all have these filters, and, and we, we go crazy if we listen to everything. And so perfectly tuned is like I'm only paying attention to the important stuff, and perfectly oblivious is like, I'm believing all this nonsense and not paying attention to signal. Now, if, if you look inside your organization, what you're, you're doing in mapping these, uh, let me uh, keep going down here. There's one way to win and four ways to lose at this. What you want is 
to have a portfolio of beliefs that are true. And by the way, you can't, you don't do this with just one belief system. It doesn't fit, whether you go to like Gödel's incompleteness theorem or Heisenberg's law, there is no like one belief system that does everything. You need a portfolio of, of knowledge that kind of matches the situation, and you want to pay attention to it at the point that it's relevant. That, that makes sense. The ways you can screw up in this whole thing is you can have false or outdated uh, models, discredited science, unfounded prejudice, WMD in Iraq, yesterday's winning formula. We believe a lot of stuff without really doing due diligence, without doing the numbers. That just isn't true, particularly in times of disruption. Yesterday's winning formula isn't the, isn't the formula for now. That's, that's maybe where like Hummers are going to say the company fits. Now, we have less problems with getting, you know, we, we do a pretty good job of spam filters. We do a pretty good job of screening. You know, there's some issues of, you know, you know maybe missing something here. But there, there are cases where we waste our time listening to stuff that doesn't make sense. This is kind of a, kind of a, a, a draw deal. And isn't, how many people use Google as your spam filter now? I mean, Gmail. Yeah, I mean, it, it does a half decent job. So, uh, and then we've got this, this big class of mistakes where, um, all the information, all the knowledge we needed is, but we weren't paying attention. We, we, and, and often it's, it's because engineers are going like, well, I'm only 90% sure, and you know, somebody else gets to make the call. We, we, there, there's opportunities here. And then we've all, got, also got these comforting stories, which are things that aren't proven or can't be proven that we tell ourselves. I go to companies and we go, we have the best people. I can't tell you how many times we've got dominant market share, and like two days later, it turns out like they, they're number three in the market. Uh, America is the greatest nation on earth. Therefore, our infant mortality is better than anybody else. Our schooling is better than anybody else. We always do the right things. There's a whole bunch of stuff that we do because of these biases to be comforting that just has no predictive utility for us. So consciously kind of matching these things. I, I'm also putting out an invitation. I, I know Joel and Shamal here. Yeah, so you've had breakfast in Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz, we actually have bumper stickers that say, you know, uh, keep it weird. It is, the, it is the headquarters for like every fringe group in the world. It's actually a delightful, you know, beautiful place. And, and you can sit in my favorite place at the community table and you can talk to Grammy Award winners and Nobel winning uh, physicists. But you can also talk to Charlie in the roller kind of here's an incredibly successful guy, runs, uh, 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 owns and runs a local golf course, drives the best car in the parking lot, and one day got up from a discussion and says, don't you know that Obama is a terrorist and all Muslims like little boys? And, and so you go, gee, Charlie, you know, uh, maybe we'll stop paying attention to you on that one. And, <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> And then there's, there's a guy who's like an incredibly good machinist who says 9-11 uh, was a fake job, Bush did it, and uh, we didn't go to the moon, and, you know, the trilateral commission's running the world. And, and he, he's like, he's, he's, he's a, an incredibly famous and skilled machinist in the disk drive industry who, who I stopped paying attention to while still being nice to him. But then there's also guys in the upper quadrant, like the guy who kind of looks like he's homeless, but is actually the nation's best person in improving website rankings and a really smart guy. So, so if you want to come to breakfast in Santa Cruz, it's a great place. Joel's been there as well. And, and you can get some experience in, in kind of mapping perceptions and belief because we got them all. Um, <clears throat> usually what happens is we have failures of attention and beliefs. The two are entwined. So we go three mile island. The operators didn't really understand how the thing worked and they weren't paying attention to the right stuff. GM, We've got these models for the industry that are wrong, and we're not paying attention to trends. Uh, uh, Iraq, we've got this belief that there's weapons of mass destruction, and if anybody thinks different, we're going to fire you or out you or do something like that. I try to find one about computer vision and its beliefs about hardware being the future of the CAD business. And so I went into Google, and I literally could not find a CV logo. In the Google image search, I found, like, curriculum vitae and stuff like that. So I guess we've actually now encapsulating our blind spots in the web itself. Uh, and, and so those are all examples. And there are what I call ba-ba loops, where what you believe changes what you, what you focus on, and what you focus on reinforces your belief. It, you can rewrite the innovator's dilemma in ba-ba loops. 
uh, a friend of Martin Pearl, who's like a Nobel-winning physicist, has told me, science makes progress one funeral at a time. And, and what, he, what he means by that is that scientists have these beliefs, and they're so stuck with them, and they so find confirming evidence, the only way you make progress is that guy dies, and his, you know, his, his, his graduate students don't, you know, you move there. And, and I would even argue that someday somebody will do ba-ba therapy. So each of us, from an early age, has like a worldview. You know, like your spouse has a worldview. You've got a worldview. And you tend, to, you, you tend to like notice only stuff that confirm that belief. So someday you'll be able to go to a therapist who says, what are your beliefs and why don't you start paying attention to this? this you know, your, your spouse is not out to get you. You'll be okay. So, <clears throat> so, so that's Baba loops. There are also triumphs of beliefs and attention. As part of this, I, I reread Drucker, who I, I think is great and just put him in a belief and attention framework. And Drucker said, he, he introduced the idea of knowledge work, that, that beliefs that are true are important. He said, we build on strengths, with the models that work, not the ones that don't, that everybody says start with the facts, but you can't do that. You have to start with opinions, the kind of this deep down stuff, focus up which one of those are relevant, and then go find the facts. So before all this cognitive research, he's saying, kind of dig a little deeper. And he has this great, quotation for Sloan that he that hardly embraces that Sloan had a bunch of people and he says, so gentlemen, I gather we all agree on this. And they all said yes. And, said, and Sloan said, then I suggest we adjourn for 24 hours until we develop some disagreement. You can't make a decision until you have disagreement. And in fact, the most effective cultures are often high conflict, high respect cultures where you have this clash of models, but at the end of the day you have a beer and you're willing to go at it again in the thing. And attention, he, he says, the executive's time is incredibly scarce. Other people are scheduling to it. It's an, a filtering and attention thing. Know your time. Know where it goes. You're probably not paying attention to the right things. Focus your attention on, on all, those data, those beliefs, those models that get the expected results. He introduced the idea of the special executive. Now life is so complicated, we need people who have in their head certain beliefs and pay attention to certain things. One person can't do it all. He said there's a difference in how people pay attention. Some, pe some people are listeners, you have to tell them. Other people are readers, you have to write it for them. Uh, he, t he gave wonderful examples of paying attention. Not Sloan back then paying attention. Thalidomide, a, 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 an FDA regulator who actually said, skin tingling, maybe we should slow a little bit down on this thing and not have the failures they eventually had. Things, and cases like the Edsel, where well, they weren't paying attention. I would note, this was not, this was not um, Drucker, but what Jack Welch is most famous for at GE is redirecting the attention of the company. Jack Welch said early on, I want you to focus on market share. And then after that, I want you to focus on workout processes, how we get this disagreement. And then he said, I want you to focus on quality. And just before he left, he says, think about how the web is going to change our business and how to focus on it. So what, what Welch did is literally reorient the whole organization to pay attention to something different at the time and a lot of its success as well as his, 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 his you know, fierce determination to spend the time goes with Taxions is actually a real word. It's, it, it's, taxion is like a touch. It's like laying down a bunt. And, and, and this is just so I can get the acronym. Every time we come up to bat, every time we have an opportunity to make a difference for the future, inventory our beliefs, ask if we're paying attention, and then make that thoughtful action. Drucker said decision making is our key task. There are a few but important decisions. You know, figure out what those are. And then take that next step, you know, and try to get on base in the future is, 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 a, is kind of the idea there. I also think that there, there will be killer apps in beliefs and attention. We've had knowledge management, which really hasn't gone very far. Well, you think about knowledge management, first thing we lack is closed loop metrics. As one example, I've gone to company after company and say, we want to design to cost, but they do not, the designer says, I think this is going to cost a buck fifty. And the designer never gets feedback of what it actually costs and how it actually performs. This is like trying to learn how to hit a baseball where we, we, you get no feedback. You're not going to do it. Uh, codification, this trying to capture thing, only gets the 1%. What we need is this clash of conflicting models that gets more than 99%. The example we saw yesterday was JPL and TMAX and what's following on. That's an environment to make decisions to surface those kind of issues. There's a lot of technology that we can do better at that. Synthesis is the, the huge problem of here. What do we do when one guy says uh, it's gonna, it, 
it's not reliable enough, and the other guy says, but it's going to cost too much to make it reliable. Innovation comes out of those conflicts. And that's the most, I actually hope to come here and, and declare victory and tell you I discovered a, an entirely new tool that will solve all of those problems, and it hasn't happened yet. Um, but I do have an idea of how we might find that tool. So if you're interested, there's a sort of a session following on this. And then and that's the modest proposal. Attention management, Deming said, profound insight only comes from outside the organization because if those are like the, 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 uh, the, the, the dead scientist problem. It's like these are people who are paying attention to different facts. They're not bound by the beliefs. I'm not that pessimistic. I think you can, you can get profound insight within your own organization. It doesn't have to be somebody outside the field, but you only get that if you consciously shift your attention. And there are tools for that. The simple, like last year when I said there were 16 ingredients to innovation in the U.S., and on 15 of the 16 were either at parity or doing worse, that can't be good. Look for things to hit the fan. And here are 16 ideas for the future. That was an example. Sub subdivision is like I lost my keys, and 100 of us line up and go, I'm paying attention, I'm paying attention, and you, and you just do that. We don't do enough of that. There's intelligence subdivision, which is even better. That's like, let's map it out like the periodic table where there's actually science behind it, and we can say, look for an element here. Scanning the field every once a year, just looking at new stuff. So there's things you can do, and I think there's an incredible power of what I'm calling Web 3.0 applications where you say, you know, to, today, uh, my, my personal opinion, I could easily be wrong, is that Twitter is like CB radio, you know, for the present. Um, but I do think that there is an opportunity um, to collect people whose models and beliefs you respect and to create mechanisms to say, pay attention to this. COFES is an example of that. You know, we go around and we say, you know, John will tell me something to pay attention to. And, I'll, and, and so, so there's an opportunity there to do attention management. And the last thing is, is uh, if you're interested in this whole topic of how do we access this information and turn it into real innovation, the session that's called Innovating Everywhere is one that Dave and I are going to be kind of, kind of having some interaction, some ideas, and if you're interested in that. So actions, if, if, uh, if, if more than 12 people give me a card that says, please tell me about biases, I will go to the trouble of making a list of the biases and telling you what they are and send it to you. Uh, but I'm not going to waste my time unless there's interest. So you can just send me a card with biases if you want to do that. Uh, and then if you're interested in kind of pursuing this, there's the innovating everywhere. Well, that's it. Uh, I think there's a huge potential to get the future a little bit better. And I think we need to be a part of that. And, and here are some thoughts of that. Uh, so without further ado, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.